Soil School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Soil Network and the Mosaic Company. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Soil School. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the state of soil health. Uh, I started covering soil health for real agriculture about 10 years ago, and at that time, I really think we had a small group of committed farmers and consultants who really preached the benefits of soil health. And, and in many cases, um, it was m- as much about religion as it was about soil science. But I've witnessed um, a huge change over the past decade. And, and today, uh, we have a tremendous soil health community um, from farmers and researchers to consultants and extension specialists. It is a dynamic group and they're doing some pretty amazing things and uh, to talk about that dynamic community and uh, and what's happening I'm joined today by Dr. Abby Wick. She's a soil health extension specialist from North Dakota State University. Abby, welcome and thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Abby, let's start this off by uh, getting your take on the the state of soil health. Um from your perspective, how has it taken hold in North American agriculture? That's, that's a great question, because like you, I, you know, I started my position here at North Dakota State University about eight years ago. And so I was probably coming in where soil health was, was just you know, getting going. Farmers were reading about it in, in national magazines, probably in Ontario as well as they were here in North Dakota. And uh, there's a lot of interest behind soil health. And one of the things that I've seen since starting my position is that um, is that it really is taking off, whether you're looking at social media or you're looking at at the meetings farmers are attending. Um, You know, we're getting new faces at our meetings all the time here. And and it's exciting because I think everybody's realizing that it's not, it doesn't have to be complicated. Number one, that it can be, you know, there's no one size fits all, it can be for any farm. um, And it can really help farmers achieve those those goals that they have for their operation, whether they're, you know, primarily long-term, but but some short-term goals as well. Now, Abby, at the recent Ontario Agricultural Conference, you and Dr. Lee Breeze shared a great conversation on this topic. And one of the things you talked about was farmers' commitment. And uh, I guess the question for you is, what are the characteristics you see in many of the farmers you meet who are, you know, truly committed to soil health? And, and how are they moving the needle on their farm? Uh, you know, I think that the word that comes to mind is curiosity. Uh, most of the farmers that are working in soil health are very curious about their systems. Um, that those questions that they have about the way they're doing things on their farm is what drives them towards change. Um, so I think most of them, you know, are, are very curious. Uh, I also think that they are somewhat stubborn in some ways. You know, yeah, they they want these practices to work, so they're not in it to try it. They're in it to make it work for their operations, and um, you know, but not so stubborn to the point where they're willing to, to take big risks and lose a lot of money or commit to something that isn't going to, isn't going to work on their farm. So, uh, so smart also comes to mind. And, and I think most farmer, you know, farmers working in agriculture and running their own businesses, they, they've got to be smart, whether they're into soil health or not. And, um, so I think, I think their, their curiosity, their commitment, their, uh, stubbornness, all those things kind of lead to these soil health practices going on their operations. Mm. And you, you and Lee talked about transparency. I mean, a lot of guys are, are doing things well, but a lot of things don't work. And everybody's willing to share as much about what does work as doesn't work. Yeah, I think that's really important to share both what does work and doesn't work. And um, number number one, it adds credibility to the person sharing the information. We know that things can't work all the time. And sometimes when we we admit to our mistakes that are made, you know, it, it shows that we're real people, uh, that we're not perfect, that you don't have to be perfect um, in your systems. So I think it adds credibility, but I also think uh, that we can learn a lot from mistakes too. Uh, the more mistakes I make on the research plots we have, or the you know the mistakes that we make as a farmer and I are, are trying a new practice on their on their farm, um, we learn just as much from those as we do the successes, if not a little bit more. So uh, being open and honest and sharing both success and failure is, is pretty critical, I think, in, in advancing soil health. Mm. Now, there's more and more researchers like you, you know, doing soil health. I, I just, I've seen it grown over the years, and you, you mentioned you're, you've joined on about eight years ago. You know, as a researcher, what, what um, can farmers learn from you and, and consultants? You know, what can you bring to the firm to soil health? Uh, you know, sometimes I let I let the farmers decide what I bring to their farm. Um, 
And that involves just a lot of listening. And I think that's one of the best thing that researchers or extension specialists can do is, is when going to a, a farm, to listen to what those farmers want out of those practices and to not come in with any assumptions that you're going to have the information they need. Um, so most of the time I let the information that I share with them be guided by their, their on-farm goals, by what they need to achieve those goals. And, and I feel like it's a lot of my job is to, to help get that information that they need from whatever resource, whether it's it's my own university or it's somebody else's university or another country, um, or to connect a farmer with another farmer. Sometimes there are questions that I can't answer. Um, and that's where I need to help make those connections to, to get them the answers they need. Yeah. And a lot of times I think uh, it's also almost being a sounding board as well. I mean, there's a lot of ideas out there. Sometimes you got to say, hey, that's good. That's bad. And ask questions like why? Yeah, asking the questions are really important, and, and sometimes we can't see see what the what the answer is, right? I mean, or, or we look at a practice and we get so blindsided by what we want to do, or how interesting it may be, or how much we want to post that picture on Twitter, uh, that it helps to have somebody come in and ask you the questions to to guide that practice. And and so I think most farmers I work with will tell you that I never tell them what to do or what not to do, um, but I just simply ask the questions to help guide their decisions and and reduce risk as much as possible while still allowing that creativity and that curiosity to to happen. Mm. Now, I guess the other side of that question is, you know, what have you learned from farmers? Um, You know, my sense is, uh, you know, it's less revolution these days and and more evolution. Uh, You know, why why use a 12 uh, cover crop mix when you can, when three three species will do? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've learned a lot from farmers for Number one, I didn't come from an agricultural background. (laughs) So everything I've learned about equipment, about rotations, about even down to harvesting a crop and and the residue coming out the back, um, you know, I've learned that all from farmers. And I think I I think that that has helped me immensely in in creating customized options or bringing new ideas to to farmers. So um, so in in a long you know, in a way we're learning from each other, you know, side by side, I'm learning about agriculture. They're learning about soils, which is something I know quite a bit about. Um, and then we're figuring out how to apply those two, those two practices to each other. So I've learned an immense amount. I certainly wouldn't be, <laughs> be where I am with the programming we have without the the farmers and, and what they've shared with me. Yeah. And you and Lee, in your conversation, you, you talked about, you know, again, the journey and more a sense of what you're hearing that, hey, you know, it's not a straight line. Um, you know, there are times when you have to go back. You, you've got to get out and get the crop off. There's roots and, you know, here comes the tillage. You've got to get out and do it. It's not a straight line. And farmers are sort of learning that navigation. Yes, they are. And and so, you know, a great example of that is our, are the ruts. We've had some very wet harvests here in North Dakota. And, and I know that there are a lot of farmers that are long-term no-till that have had to go in and, and they've had to repair some ruts because, number one, they had to get the crop off the field. And now they've got to take care of that field so that they can not feel those ruts over the next 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, so learning that that sometimes we have to do things that maybe we don't want to do. Um, and, and I think farmers are, they can see the the long-term goal. They can see the big picture in that. Um, and like you, you were mentioning the, the diverse mixes versus simplified mixes. Um, you know, I think as long as it achieves your goal, it doesn't matter what you're doing or how you get there, but, but that you're getting there. Um, so another example of something I've learned is, is I used to think when you picked a grass for a cover crop mix, it would have to be all cereal rye or it'd have to be all oats or all barley. And it, it didn't occur to me till one of the farmers we talk about on the video, Tony Wagner was like, well, I just did 10 pounds of rye and then I did, you know, 30 pounds or 20 pounds of oats. And, and I was like, ah, oh, I didn't even think about that, that you could just do two grasses and, and customize it to your soil. So, um, yeah, lots of, lots of modifications that, that people are learning and figuring out. Yeah. Living and learning. That's for sure. Hey, final question for you. Um, you know, where does this go from here? And, uh, you know, what can this community, you know, farmers, researchers, extension specialists like yourself, researchers, you know, what does health, soil health look like in 10 years from now? Boy, I, I wish I knew. Um, I, I do think that, I do think we should be taking care of all these or uh, taking advantage of all these virtual opportunities. So one of the things I was noticing in the farmers I work with here in North Dakota is that we were getting very localized meetings, you know, where, where farmers that were interacting were interacting with the same farmers quite often. And since going virtual, they've now been interacting with farmers all over the world. 
And so one of the meetings we had, I looked in the one of the rooms where people are having a discussion and they had somebody from Virginia, Ontario, North Dakota, South Dakota, Arkansas. They were all in one room talking about a specific topic. And I think that's what's going to push everybody forward. So uh, really, you know, as much as bummed as we are, as we can't meet face to face, I think really taking advantage of those virtual opportunities to get to know people from all over the world and their practices is going to open up, open up soil health immensely. Awesome. Hey, Abby, a great conversation. Great insights. Uh, great to have you on the Soil School. Hope to catch up with you down the road. Yeah, thank you very much.